So folks, right now, as we speak, everyone is attempting to lie to you. And I know you're not going to fall for it. And I know I'm not falling for it. And reasonable people won't either. Because what you're hearing from Jim Jordan and many of his allies is that he's turned the corner. That after a rough few days, he's on the charging path towards getting his dream job. But that's not what's really happening. And if you listen to his own words and his body language, it says a very different story. So hit the like and subscribe button. It really helps me out and we're gonna jump right into it. Because there is this narrative, on the one hand, most reasonable people are saying it still looks really grim. And while he's won a few extra votes in the last 24 hours or so, Jim himself makes it clear he is cooked. When those are the incentives, then everybody is on an island. And, 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 and play to your base because primary right. politics really drives so much within the House. And it, it's particularly among those members who voted to oust. There were eight who voted to oust Kevin McCarthy in that historic, unprecedented vote that happened almost two weeks ago now. And I got a chance to catch up with several of them, asking them about concerns, blowback that they may have gotten because of the fact that the House is paralyzed. They can't act on anything until they elect a speaker, but they say no regrets. Mr. Rosendale, do you regret your vote at all to oust no, Speaker no. McCarthy? We made a lot of progress in there today. I'm really, I really feel good. No regrets. No regrets. No. Followed the rules. Mm -hmm. That's the rules of Congress, and that's what we got. I think it was the right call, and I think we're going to come out of uh, this process stronger, a fighting Republican force. The way my voters feel, they look at the country, they look at the direction that we're going, and they don't think that we get out of this without pain or discomfort, and neither do I. But look, listen to how a swing district Republican, Don Bacon, feels about the position that those members put him in. It hurts the country. It hurts Congress. It's hurting our party. Uh, they're, they're putting us in a bad hole for next November. Does it put a swing district like yours at risk? Yeah, it does. It's, these guys want to be in the minority. That's exact, I think they would prefer that because they can just vote no and yell and scream all the time. I mean, there's a real fear that this all could cost them the House. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the DCCC Democrats are watching this very closely. They don't even have to intervene in it because they know the challenges that Republicans are bringing upon themselves. They have not been able to prove that they're able to govern anything that's monumental they've done. They've done with the help of Democrats, which ultimately got Kevin McCarthy to lose his position. And that is ultimately some of the challenge with Jim Jordan, too, as being the speaker. Some of these swing state Biden uh, district Republicans think that Jim Jordan cannot come to their district to raise money for them, that it's only going to alienate those swing voters that they need in order to win. And so this, there's just so many complications mm. here, so many layers. I don't see how the Republicans pull it together and unify over someone in the next few days. Uh, we'll see. The other question is, do they try to prop up interim speaker Patrick McHenry, something that could potentially need Democratic support to do? What do Democrats want in exchange? Hakeem Jeffries suggested give them more power in the legislative process, something the Republicans don't want to give up. But those types of discussions will get more serious the longer this drags out. And Manu touched on this, but I think it's important to explain the dynamics of why Jim Jordan thinks that he could be ultimately successful in just shoving this through and calling out the moderates, because again, it is the moderates who look at Jim Jordan and say, uh-uh, I'm not going to support him. And the reason is, Jackie? I mean, moderates, it, it is, uh, I mean, no offense to any moderates out there, but they usually cave. They usually- But there's a reason pressure. for it, a political reason. Because they could be, they could be primaried and they could lose their seat on the front end. Now the issue is a lot of these uh, moderates are from seats where Biden won. And so they are much more prone to a Democratic challenger than even potentially a Republican challenger. So they're, they're, they're in a tight spot and they're gonna be the first ones that voters take to task if they are angry come November of next year. And there are 18 of those. There are yes. 18 Republicans in Biden one district. So that'll be one area to watch tomorrow. But also, as Monty was saying, the three uh, who changed their minds this morning. Let's put them up about, on the screen. Uh, sure. Missouri's Ann Wagner, uh, Ken Calvert of California, and Mike Rogers of Alabama. These, if he does become speaker. Talk about something that we never could have imagined any of us covering Congress yes. a decade ago during the last government shutdown when a John Boehner called him. No less. Yeah. yeah, exactly. When John Boehner called him a legislative terrorist. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because if he does win, we're going to be having a lot more conversations about this. But 
because it looks like we're going to have a vote tomorrow on uh, whether or not he will be speaker. It uh, bears a discussion right now, which is you said John Boehner called him a legislative terrorist. When I was covering Congress, when John Boehner was speaker, uh, Jim Jordan was the bane of his ex existence. Yeah. Uh, Jim Jordan was one of the flamethrowers from the outside. The last thing he wanted was unity. He wanted uh, sort of chaos because uh, it, it helped push his ideals. At the time, it was Tea Party and the, or Freedom Caucus, which was you know, lowering spending and, and things of that nature. Fast forward to the Trump era, and part of why the moderates, uh, as you mentioned, the Republican moderates, are reluctant on Jim Jordan is because of his role, alleged role, uh, in the January 6th insurrection on that very building where they all work. And just a reminder, of a, this is just reporting from December of 2021, a text that Jim jo Jordan forwarded uh, to Mark Meadows encouraging Mike Pence to overturn the election. On January 6th, this is the day before, on January 6, 2021, Vice President Mike Pence, as President of the Senate, should call out all electoral votes that he believes are unconstitutional as no electoral votes at all. This is something that Pence many times since has said was not his role to do. And we know from Jordan himself that he spoke to former President Trump several times that day. It's never known what, he, what, what the conversation was about, but Jordan himself has said that. Um, and I think what this does, this is a big shift for the Republicans, because as we've seen, speakers and minority leaders tend to be people that waited their turn, tend to be people that went through kind of the more establishment Republican channels. Even Kevin McCarthy is someone who kind of came up in leadership in that very traditional vein. Jordan is a departure from that. He is, he never, he, yes, he got close to Kevin McCarthy, but he didn't come from the John Boehner school of becoming a leader. And what that looks like, I think we're guaranteed to have an even more partisan house. So for the next 24 hours, this. fascinating to see how many other arms he can uh, twist here, but yeah. uh, it's heading that uh, direction, but who knows after yeah. 13 days without a speaker. Well, uh, Ann Wagner and, and Mike Rogers uh, publicly saying they would support us, uh, two great members. Uh, who do all kinds of great work. Um, so that was uh, that was that was really really big. So I feel I feel real good about the momentum we have, and I think we're, we're real close. So the vote's going to be tomorrow. Do you do you uh, will you go to the floor even if you don't have 270 votes to locked tomorrow. up? That's, only, that's how our system, our great system, works, um, and we will go to the floor tomorrow. Um, it's not about pressure on anybody. It's just about we got to have a speaker. You can open the house and do the work of the American people and help our dearest and closest friend Israel if you don't have a speaker. So we get the speaker, we, we get the house open, and we get to work on uh, the resolution and, and supplemental for, for Israel. Um, and we get back to work for the American people. And that's what I'm committed to doing, because, and I think it's going to happen tomorrow. Because you had said before you want to have 217 first. Well, I, I do think that's, that's ideal. But uh, as one of my colleagues said in the room, I don't know if, if there's any way to ever get that in the room. Mm -hmm. I would love that. But I think the only way to do this is the way the founders intended is you, uh, you have the vote tomorrow. Um, we've set it for 12 o'clock. And um, I feel real good about it. Well, you have more than one ballot if you don't get to 217 on the we're first. Gonna, we're going to elect the speaker tomorrow. That's, that's, uh, that's what I think is going to happen. We've got to come together. We, we have to unify. We have to come together. And a key acknowledgement there that he doesn't think anybody can get 217 votes initially. So we could see a, play, a replay of what happened in January when Kevin McCarthy went to the floor on 15 ballots. Ultimately, he got elected. But at that point, he had opposition from the more conservative hardliners in the House Republican Conference. Those hardliners, many of them who voted out Kevin McCarthy in historic fashion, are supporting Jim Jordan. The people who are opposed to Jordan at the moment are more of the establishment, more moderate members, some from swing districts, will they be the ones holding up their hands, voting for somebody else, and trying to scuttle Jim Jordan's ascension on the House floor, that could open them up to a relentless and intense pressure campaign from Jordan supporters, including the former president. Will they be able to withstand that pressure? Jordan's allies don't think they will, think mm -hmm. that they'll ultimately come to his side. But as you're seeing here, Dana, we're headed to a significant co potential confrontation on the floor here after two weeks of Republican infighting and chaos and paralysis in the chamber. Can they get the chamber moving again? Jordan is betting they can by tomorrow night. Yeah, and I just want to underscore 
for for our viewers the news that you just got out of Jim Jordan that he is you said it but I think it's important to say it again that he is going to take this to the floor of the House of Representatives tomorrow about this time in order to have a vote even though he doesn't have that magic 217 which is the majority of those voting at this point uh, that he needs to be Speaker of the House. He's hoping that he will just push people, twist people's arms, make it happen, much like we So you can see that, right? You really get a sense that, oh, Jim Jordan uh, is, is still in big trouble. Uh, there's not really a path for him, not a clear path for him to get there. That yes, he flipped some votes and some of those votes are influential people. But three people doesn't magically turn into 55 plus people. It just doesn't, right? This is not alchemy. You can't turn lead into gold. You can't turn three people into 55 people, right? Can't do it. It's not a thing. And so, yeah, some of those people might, even if they each flip seven people, eight people, 10 people, if each of those, that still only gives you 33 votes, not 55, right? He's in big trouble. And you listen to him there, right? You listen to him when he says, oh, we can't get that done in the room. And that was a slip there. Everyone thinks he's referring to the GOP only room. And maybe that's what he meant on the surface. But what he actually said was, there may be no way to get this done in the room. And by that, I mean both the GOP room and the big room, the, 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 the house itself, the room that the house is in. Jim doesn't really believe in himself. He says we're going to have it done tomorrow. He doesn't believe that. He's made massive errors. And his errors include making promises. His errors include his cover-ups on personal issues, uh, his support of the coup, uh, and trying to bully people in the last few days, which will have the opposite effect. Jim is done.